Hey guys, how's it going? This is Derek Berg with another oldfootbasics.com Discover podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, today, we're actually going to be talking about the drill out process along with chemicals that are used in the process and equipment that's used in the podcast and in, in the process. So definitely going to be a pretty high level overview of, of a handful of different topics in relations to drill out. Um, from memory, I don't think we've really hit on drill out operations much at all on this podcast. So I'm pretty excited to, to get this content and um, de- this definitely ties into a lot of other things that we're doing right now that we're publishing and webinars that we're having. So I'll hit on that in just a quick second. But uh, before we dive in too deep, I want to introduce my co-host for the episode. Uh, you've heard him before. Uh, Jacob Mata is returning for another episode here. He's <laughs> one of our interns. So great to have you back on again, Jacob. Yeah, it's great to be back on. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, just a quick recap, if you missed that episode, he's one of our, our interns. He's from uh, UT Austin, studying petroleum engineering and a senior there. So uh, he's working on uh, drilling and completions for us, uh, some of the topics in that area, uh, and trying to gather content on it. So uh, in partnership with Drill Chem, we're coming up with some pretty awesome material. And Jacob, you want to kind of fill us in on what all's happening in that re- in that regard? Uh, yes. Yeah, so we've are actually partnering with Drill Kim, and we are hosting a four-part webinar series. So the one tomorrow, we'll actually be able to join Lubkins for right. oil-based and water-based mud, and the following week, we'll actually be a little going a lot more detail about what we'll be talking about today with completion chemicals and mixing plants. Those are held uh, on Tuesday from 12 to 1, and um, you can actually register for that at oilfieldbasics.com, or you can check our Oilfield Basics LinkedIn page. Uh, for the registration links and for more info about those yeah and uh those are all at noon central standard time so they're kind of built up to be lunch and learns um but you know we're not exactly providing lunch virtually so <laughs> <laughs> you'll have to provide your own lunch i guess but uh, those are definitely some events that we're uh, hosting and you know as part of having an expanded team with the interns uh there's definitely more coming down the line uh, from a webinar standpoint, but then also and so live events, but then also, uh, you know, obviously more more podcasts coming out with um, them as co-hosts. But uh, we're working on a lot of courses right now with individuals, and of course, um, the webinars that we're doing with Drillcam they'll be available also if you can't view them live um, as courses on our site um, afterwards. So there's a lot of content that's rushing at you guys. So <laughs> keep an eye out for for our site. Follow us on on LinkedIn, and and, and you know, there's a lot more coming out. Uh, in the future weeks and, and months. So love love having all you interns um, on board. But uh, and we'll, without further ado, we'll dive into the topic and I'll let uh, Jacob introduce our speaker, another returning speaker. Yes. So he was on a previous podcast with with Derek and myself. He's a graduate of Texas A&M University and he's currently a sales account manager at Drill Chem. How are you doing today, Cole? Doing great. It's another hot day out here in Midland. Right. <laughs> it's good to have you on. Yeah. And just a quick mention too, you know, if um, you guys haven't, uh, didn't get to hear the episode, it's a couple episodes back, uh, we talked about specialty drilling additives uh, with Colt and it was kind of the leading into, you know, some of the other webinars you know, that we're doing with them also. So uh, check that episode out. Definitely a really good uh, resource to get started on into this, into this world, right? So I'm really happy to be working with Joe Kim. Yeah, we're glad to be partnering with you all and, and doing the podcast and getting some of these webinars out on our LCM and lube and, and also mixing plants and chemicals. So thanks again for having me on. Yeah, no problem. These are definitely topics that, I, at least from my perspective as a student, and, and Jacob can probably attest to this too. I mean, we hear about these things, right? But we never know too much about, you know, how we actually run things or what, you know, what it actually looks like in the field. Uh, we just kind of know that it exists. So it's been really neat to, to dive into it deeper with, with you guys on the podcast, but then also in the webinars that we're doing. So and in terms of diving into to this um, this topic, so we, we mentioned you know, we're going to be diving into drill out, right? And the processes and chemicals and equipment, just to kind of a recap. <laughs> um, Cole, I'd love to, to get you to kind of help fill us in on, you know, what exactly drill out is you know for our audience you know listens from different areas of the industry right they may or may not be familiar or very familiar with drill out so what is it why do we do it um uh, what's the point <laughs> and then uh, where does all this begin to fit in sure well so the drill out process begins when the frack crews leave location so that can really depend uh, maybe a week after frack leaves, two weeks, three weeks, sometimes operators will want to wait two or three months. It really all just depends kind of how a frack crew will follow a drilling rig. So once the rig leaves, the frack crew comes in. And then the last step to complete the well 
is the drill out process. And so here at Drill Cam, we offer our mixing plants and chemicals. So we have both of those. So I'll be going over the equipment that's used, the chemicals that are ran, and uh, just the drill out process overall. So mm-hmm. why is it important to actually to, to drill out? Well, you want to get out the plugs and debris. So that might be sand, residual sand from the frack or some of the plug parts that are drilled out from the from the actual frack itself or small bits of formation. So as you drill these plugs out, if, if they're in the well bore or if you have a bunch of other debris down a hole, uh, it's called junk, then you, you could get stuck. <laughs> So that's, we're real, that's we're real technical with our names. <laughs> <laughs> well, and speaking of technical, if you get stuck, then you might have to go fishing. So, which is right. <laughs> really, really expensive and a uh, big headache for guys out here. There's an operator I was talking to last year. They, they ended up getting stuck twice. And so they lost uh, a lot of coil and then a bunch of downhole <laughs> tools and everything. So, and then your production engin- engineers are mad at you because this is the last step before they start producing the well and making money. So obviously you want to try to be as efficient as Entirely. possible. When, yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. So on location, you'll have either stick pipe or cold tubing. So stick pipe is sometimes you'll see, they look like workover rigs. Most people call them high spec completion units. Um, or they'll have the, the big cold tubing units out. You'll also have flow back on location and they're there to monitor returns and catch those drill plugs as they circulate out. And after each plug, they'll lay it out on the ground or they, they'll have a, a napkin or, or something, piece of paper underneath it. And they'll actually weigh it sometimes to see how much of that plug they got back. So that kind of gives them an idea of how much of those plugs are still left down hole because they know how much mm-hmm. each plug weighs. And that's caught by what's called a plug catcher. So as it comes out, there's this uh, piece of iron and it basically it has a filter in it. And as those plugs come through, it'll the water will, and uh, sand will pass through that. But then the filter will stop those plugs and then you pull it out and then dump the plugs out. So flow back also typically handle water transfer too, although we do that as well. So it really just depends on operator preference. Sometimes they want flow back to handle it or sometimes they'll ask us to do it just for simplicity reasons. And then the actual mixing plants themselves, which like I said, is where we come into play. They blend the fluids and the chemicals and then shoot those down hole to get the, get the debris out. Yeah, and just to kind of I'd like to and hit back on the idea of circulation, right, and, and what's actually going on downhole during this process. And so, I mean, you kind of mentioned, you know, we're drilling out plugs, right? So the plugs are just meant to isolate different parts of the lateral and treat you know, small sections of the formation instead of doing the whole lateral one. So if someone isn't familiar with completions, you know, that's what we're trying to deal with. And there's technologies and kind of, you know, more and more companies are to some extent going to dissolvables and things where they may not need to drill out. But at the same time, even a lot of those wells, you'll still see some form of drill out um, occurring just to, again, like Cole had mentioned, cleaning up the junk <laughs> that's in the well bore. And even those dissolvable plugs don't typically fully, fully dissolve. Uh, I may make some people mad in saying that, but uh, <laughs> there might be some salesmen that tell you different or whatever, but uh, there, there's a lot of pros and cons to the dissolvables. And then in terms of, you know, when, the, when this is actually happening, right, it's similar almost to the drilling process, except the hole is already there. Um, and we're just kind of working within the casing that we set um, to d- basically try and drill everything out to, to full ID of the casing, right? And you're circulating um, your, your fluids and you're going to be talking about some additives, you know, that, that you guys have that you can add into it and, um, you know, to, cir- to circulate all, out, all the junk in the pieces, right? Um, what, what's the, what, what fluid is kind of like the base, right? Of what everybody's circulating. Is it typically the, you know, brine, um, I assume, you know, there's no reason to do mud, but, uh, you know, just kind of trying to get everybody on the same page in terms of what's happening down hole here before we go too much further. So you'll be drilling out with water and you'll hear sometimes low, mid or high brine, uh, like a fresh water would be considered a low brine or produced water would be considered a high brine. And so it depends on where you're at. Most commonly we see fresh water just because it's cheaper. You can have it trucked in from the frag ponds that you see, at least out here in West Texas, they're all over. The truck will go out there, pick up the water and then, and then bring it back 
two locations and you'll have frack tanks on location to actually hold the water. Mm -hmm. But it, fresh water is more economical, but depending on some certain areas, regulations are getting passed where they don't want to use this fresh water. So they're trying to incentivize operators to use produced water. So like in New Mexico, that's a big thing now, or even in Texas, the bigger operators who, who can afford to, to use this produced water. I know out here just north of Big Spring, there's a plant that actually recycles the water that's used, cleans it up a little bit, uh, but it, it's still produced water, which typically would just be injected. In. And um, so you'll actually use that, although it is more expensive because you are paying to recycle that water. Or sometimes you'll hear uh, TDS, which is total dissolved solids. So that's uh, how many solids are in a particular water system. So like a fresh water would have a lower TDS and then that that produced water would have typically have a, a higher total dissolved solids. So. Okay. Yeah. And <laughs> you, I was kind of um, surprised too when I, so when I was visiting my family over uh, kind of the holidays um, or July, it's kind of weird to call it, uh, July 4th, you know, at that, that time um, that gotten a, a water filter for, you know, water purifier for their, their kitchen. And uh, it even had a TDS monitor on it. So <laughs> definitely, uh, definitely you see that even in our own uh, kind of lifestyle, I guess, <laughs> probably even in your yep. own household. <laughs> but yeah, so everything goes back to economics, kind of like as you're talking about, like whatever works best for you know that that particular operator uh, with what access to resources they have and whatnot but um kind of you know along the the equipment line two and kind of also along this lines you know what we're circulating um correct me if i'm wrong too but just to kind of further draw this picture out for everybody you know a lot of operators um whenever they are doing the drill process trying to basically try to maintain what barrel in barrel out right so you're you're literally just flushing the way you're trying to you know because you are now exposed to the formation i mean you perforated and you know fractured right so you can very much produce uh from the well if you're not careful um right i'm just trying to want to throw that in here for uh, context also if you have something to add on that end yeah and that's where flowback comes in into play so you'll have some frag tanks out there with that water that we're using and circulating mm -hmm. in and out. And then sometimes they say, man, you know, we, while we were drilling this well, we kept taking kicks and we think that it's, uh, it's really gonna produce. So uh, they might have uh, some more of those frack tanks to handle some of that oil as it comes back, or they might have a flare if, they, if they're expecting a lot of gas to come back so they can flare the gas off. Uh, so that, that's what, Flowback is out there doing just really watching that and seeing how it's coming in. A lot of these wells, especially wells that are drilled today, mm -hmm. you have to have artificial lift on just because you know it's, it's so hard to get oil and gas out of the shell. So a lot of times you'll you you'll have a little bit of you know some oil and gas coming back, but really when you're producing, you see the IPs of say 2,000 barrels of oil a day. Well, that won't come on until you put some sort of artificial lift. Um, on there so and then open the choke step we'll just let it completely flow once your tanks and your batteries all set up mm -hmm. and that's also going to be very uh, very much kind of formation and area and operator dependent also too because i mean even uh, wyoming and you know northeast and uh, you know some other place too i mean you can free flow them for sometimes months or years but uh definitely sounds like more in texas you know there's a whole lot more liquids that they're dealing with um <laughs> to the artificial lift is kind of needed earlier so that's a good point <laughs> that you bring in <laughs> so when y'all are drilling out do y'all just in case this does happen we all start producing oil and gas do y'all already have these separator systems like on site just in case yeah again it, it just really depends on on if the operator uh, has something out there sometimes they'll have what's you know called kill mud and so if things really start to get out of hand you'll have a, a truck waiting out there to pump that heavy water down there, which just as drilling mud acts to, to balance that weight out between the formation pressure, um, it'll actually kind of cancel out and, and keep it static if, if you if you start to run into something pretty hairy. Yeah, it depends on preferences up to you because a lot of times the, the flow back teams will even, have, you know, it's flowing back into separators and, you know, whether they store any produced, um, you know, oil or whatever that does come back, you know, into tanks on site whether it's the permanent production facility or whether it's temporary tank i mean it all just depends on how they have that site uh, set up and yeah go ahead and 
and really it depends on the acreage because I know some of the big operators out here, they're drilling infill wells. So mm-hmm. you have most of the, of the bones already set up. So if you, <clears throat> if you did want to go ahead and start producing, you have the batteries nearby, or at least a battery that you, you plan to send production to, or uh, it might already be tied into the pipeline. But I've been on jobs where it's a smaller operator down on the coast in Brazoria County, but they produced, um, I think, 72 barrels an hour or something. So it came in pretty slow, or I say slow, but uh, <laughs> you know, when you're used to big production out here, if something's coming in at 30 barrels an hour, then it's, it's you know, a little bit different than out here. But. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and and also too, kind of on on this regard, you know, you'd mentioned companies pumping kill fluid. I mean, obviously, it's something you're gonna try to avoid, right? That's something a lot of times production teams over hesitate to do is pump any type of kill fluid, especially on just a well you just spent millions of dollars to to frack and because of any potential associated formation damage and and even you know what you have to do with uh, the the fluid whenever you get it back and it's yeah, it's kind of a mess. <laughs> Yeah, so at this point, I mean, you you spent ten to twelve million dollars drilling and fracking it, so you don't want to be that guy that screws that up when you're about to put it online and start making some money. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's all kinds of things that uh, can add cost as you go through this. You mentioned getting stuck and you know, with, with coil and, and and stick pipe and you know, what what do you see used most commonly um, in South or I guess your West Texas, right, um, in the Permian area? What do you see used most commonly out there? Is it um, you know the the stick pipe so um with the, with you know the rigs or the standalone units or with uh coiled tubing what do you see used most often out there well so this is kind of a divisive topic as well because you have <laughs> you have some operators that are using coil tubing now that they've used stick pipe for the past 30 years or they they still believe in stick pipe because they don't want coal tubing to get stuck so there's <laughs> It, it, just like asking a guy what his favorite hunting rifle is, you're going to get different answers on that. It just depends. But for example, with like, uh, with these, with stick pipe, some say it's too slow because you have to stop to break connections. If you think of just like when you're drilling a well, putting those joints of pipe together, you have to make and break those connections. And so, uh, sometimes that can take a while, but really a good crew, if you have experienced guys, they could do it in less than mm-hmm. a minute. So if you look on YouTube, you can, you can search any of these, uh, these guys are, are going against each other as fast as they can. So they, yeah, uh, they can, they can knock it out pretty quick. The pros of using stick pipe is that you're constantly rotating with a power swivel. So for the guys on the drilling side, that's basically a smaller top drive. And so that's, that's what's spinning the, the pipe as you go down hole. So you're, you're constantly rotating. And another benefit is you can push, with stick Mm -hmm. since it is more rigid and as you get more of that weight further out and the wellbore the weight of the string acts like a hammer so you can you can put more weight on the stick pipe to tag these longer laterals Mm -hmm. as they get further out and with cold tubing which is where i used to work with quality tubing at nov in houston uh, technology has really evolved in the past 10 to, to 15 years has come a long ways. So as these, as these laterals have approached two miles to two and a half miles, mm-hmm. when guys were using stick pipe because cool tubing, I would say couldn't get out that far, but there were definitely some limitations. Mm-hmm. But as, uh, as that technology has really evolved, for instance, with cool tubing, that's basically steel pipe that's, that's rolled on something that looks like a a fishing reel. So if you think of some of these wells out here, if total depth is 23,000 feet, well, you have to have at least 23,000 feet Mm -hmm. plus to to mill out all the plugs to TD. So 23 to 25,000 feet of pure steel and plus the trailer that it comes on with two and three eighths or two and five eighths are kind of the most common now, it can get really heavy. Mm-hmm. So depending on what state you're in, uh, Louisiana and Texas, New Mexico, they're not that uh, heavily regulated. But say somewhere in the Northeast where if, if we have a, a spool of coal tubing leaving from Houston and then going up to your neck of the woods, Derek, in the Northeast, one of those limitations that, that we faced was a lot of those roads and bridges are so old, they're, <laughs> they're, 
they're short to say and, the and least. So, <laughs> yeah, and so uh, the the actual cool tubing units when they were taking the the cool tubing strings as they're called when they take, when they take the strings up there, you might have to swing out a thousand to fifteen hundred miles because the bridge you want to that you need to get under is ten feet tall and you need twenty feet tall, and so that was another issue. But as long as you as long as you plan correctly, you can get around that. But so with cool tubing. With the technology nowadays, there's different grades, and also there's tapered strings. And so, used to it was mainly just straight wall cool tubing, mm-hmm. and so there's different wall thicknesses. And again, with it being so heavy, you run into a lot of issues tearing up roads, maybe uh, getting a location, things like that. And so, what is being done now is you have a, a certain wall thickness, and then it'll actually get skinnier and then kind of balloon back out. So in the middle of that string, they'll take off a bunch of weight. Hmm. And so that allows it to get, to be transferred a lot easier. But so with cool tubing, uh, I would say out here, I I definitely see it out here a lot, South Texas, a lot, just because those laterals are shorter. And that's one of the things that operators look at is once we get further out, how likely is it that our cool tubing is going to get stuck because cool tubing isn't rotating like stick pipe is. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's very important to uh, be running tools that reduce that. I know like Wildcat has, I believe their Tomcat tool, NOV has some different products and things. And so you have your motor. So if you think of that cool tubing, as it gets further out, as um, it, it goes in the lateral, you will see have kind of like a porpoising event as you tag these plugs towards the toe of the well. And so it just it just depends, but I, with technology coming a long ways, some people view cool tubing as being a, a quicker alternative since it's constantly running in hole and it's getting pulled into the hole by the injector head, which is at the right above the well head and just pulling it in the hole. Mm-hmm. But so one of the issues with, with that cool tubing is if you think of a paper clip, so each time that you spool that cool tubing on and off the reel, it's just like bending that paper clip back and forth. So at some point, there's going to be a failure, and so you'll have fatigue on that pipe. But there, there's modeling software, things you can use to. It's going to watch how many how many times or how much footage this cold tubing has been ran. So you can kind of watch these certain areas, or you might have pitting from bacteria that could form a pinhole. And mm-hmm. so with these mass amounts of pressure that you're pumping that hole, it could hit that pinhole and then part that pipe. And then once that cold tubing is parted I mean, you, you could technically do a field weld, but it just really depends on where it's at. We actually in Houston, when I was at quality tubing, we had to be careful because of, of lightning storms would come through. And so as the cold tubing, it's just one continuous piece of steel is getting mm-hmm. milled. If your power went out, well then it, it would, it wouldn't hit that. It would connect that certain part of the steel. And so you'd have to cut it right there. And then you might have a 10,000 foot string of cold tubing when you really, really you need 25,000 oh, feet. Yeah. So, but yeah, really it just, it, it depends. Uh, some guys don't want to, uh, they maybe got stuff with cold tubing twice or, uh, or so yeah, it really just depends. So would you say there's a higher risk associated with cold tubing, just kind of based on what you've been talking about. Um, but also, is because I know for me personally as a student and I guess growing up in West Texas, all I've never heard of stick piping. Is that what it was? Sorry. <laughs> uh, till today, but um, is there a cost benefit to using coil tubing instead of the other? Well, so with coil tubing, really it just, when, when you're looking at, um, at how much time that, that's going in and out, because a lot of these, the cold tubing units, mixing plants, whatever, they might have a day rate, they might have a, you know, a, a 12 hour rate, something like that. So, and it really depends on what service company you get out there because there's some service companies that uh, they might have better coil than they do stick pipes. So if you're, if you're loyal to a certain service company and they, they treat you well, they've always done good work, then you'll stick with them. Or sometimes with cold tubing units, really with that technology, coming such a long way shortly i know that the the lead times to manufacture the actual units themselves were 
we're a barrier. So you might go with stick pipe until these cool tubing companies can actually catch up with demand. I mean, now it's all, it's all caught up and everything. If you drive around out here, you'll see plenty of yards full of, of cool tubing units and stick pipe units as well. So there's, there's plenty to go around right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Jacob, you might be con- stick pipe is based, you know, that's just used with like a normal workover rig or an upgraded workover rig. Um, so you might have, you probably have seen it. You maybe just didn't yeah. associate it with actually drill out. Um, okay. But whenever, you know, you're actually using a rig to do it, like Cole was talking about stick pipe method, right? You're, you're basically having to deal with snubbing uh, because you've got, it's not just a flush, you know, continuous piece of pipe that you can just shove in. You have to stop and actually perform snubbing operations to get those collars through um, your BOPs and your, your pressure barriers. So that's, I think, one of the, reasons that a lot of companies like to use coil to some extent when they can um, just because to some extent there's a less risk than uh, snubbing operations from a variety of standpoints um, and some of your crazy uh, well control videos and on YouTube are from snubbing <laughs> operations um, so uh, th- there's a lot of things that kind of go into to picking either one and, and northeast a lot of people have used um, the stick pipe um, and then Texas definitely seems to be a lot in Colorado too. I can speak to you also seems to be a lot of coil. A lot of it depends on, you know, uh, even well lengths, um, average lateral lengths, uh, play a big part of that too. And the lockup and the friction, which I'm sure Cole hit on here in a few minutes with, uh, some products to deal with friction, but, uh, anything else you want to add to this Cole? Yeah, I think you hit it right on the head. If you're, if you're drilling, say a three and a half mile lateral, then obviously you'll use stick pipe. So mm-hmm. it's kind of. If you're if the lateral is, is two miles long, then I think people kind of mm-hmm. eased into use cool tubing because they said, well, if I'm constantly running in the hole, it's and uh, it's just it can be a lot quicker than having to stop and, and mm-hmm. make these connections. So quicker, but you have a lot a little bit more more risk of things going wrong potentially just because like you're talking about like you're not rotating, you don't have as much leeway per se and in, in pushing and pulling um and you have to worry about more about fatigue and that kind of thing some things that you can control it'll be easier with stick pipe but so many factors into just that decision <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> definitely a lot yeah. of good points to bring out and hopefully this shed some light to you know someone uh, who's trying to learn more about this space but uh so and it also depends on on the frag plugs themselves so mm-hmm. you see ranging anywhere from 20 plugs to up to 100 plugs but again, it depends on the length of that lateral and the number of clusters, the cluster spacing, or the you know, distance between each stage. Mm-hmm. So the more plugs, the longer naturally it'll take to drill out. But also depends on the type and material of the plug. So you mentioned dissolvable cast iron was historically the standard. Uh, some guys will still run it, but that, that takes longer to mill out. And so if you, if you think of the bit that you're using as well, so you might have a milled tooth bit or you might have mm-hmm. a more expensive bit, uh, PDC bit, that can drill out these plugs a lot quicker. Especially now, most guys are running at least composite, or they might run a combination of those composite plugs and then the, the dissolvable plugs. So composite, kind of, uh, as you get closer to your hill of the well, and then running the dissolvable plugs towards the toe of the well. So, like you mentioned, Derek, dissolvable plugs, especially when I was at quality tubing is one of the things we were looking at is that technology coming around. And so I think it has made some headway, but some operators are still running that composite. And then once they get further up to the toe, those, those dissolvable plugs have longer, have longer time to actually dissolve. And so I think that they are gaining popularity, but still there are some setbacks and you have to have, there's a, a company out here I was talking to because they were having issues with these dissolvable plugs with their fluids. So we did some testing for them to figure out what exactly a good match of the fluids would be from our lab to, to dissolve these plugs as quickly as we could. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And even on the, the, you know, the wells that are longer, I mean, so if it's dissolved with less resistance in a sense to drill against, and you don't have to worry about uh, hopefully getting stuck as easy and, um, also one thing to note too, on the coil tubing, um, you're able to rotate the bit with a downhole motor. So you pretty much have to run a motor, right? So the string isn't running or isn't rotating, but the bit, um, is with the motor. So might be some limitations there too, but, uh, 
Definitely. Yeah, and, and that's 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 the key is to run a, a good motor. So mm-hmm. you're increasing that bit speed, and, and yes, yeah, so you, you have to run that. And there's some other tools out there too that will reduce that that buckling effect. So it doesn't, you know, if you're sitting on top of a plug trying to mill it out, and then it just starts buckling like that, then mm-hmm. obviously it's going to take a while. And then all the associated issues with that. Yeah. And I'll add on one additional point here, and I think we can move on to kind of talking about the chemicals and how this um, works into the process. But uh, another quick factor, just a cool thing to know, um, sometimes operators can even run, uh, if they are doing a stick pipe drill out, they can actually run basically their production string on the end of the stick pipe. And so you have kind of like a work uh, work string on the top and then your production tubing on the, the, the bottom half of your string or whatever, so that whenever you're done drilling out, you can actually pump off the bit and then hang, just pull back so far to your production tubing and then actually hang your production tubing off of it. So off your wellhead. So you can save some time there. So it's all, there's so many <laughs> things that go into this, but uh, just a cool little fun fact to know. And you can ask about if you go on site, ask if they're doing that. But <laughs> but uh, yeah, so in terms of, you know, we, we definitely, you know, friction, everything has come into this. Um, I know um, one of the common products that are discussed um, that I've heard about, you know, is the idea of pipe on pipe, right? Or running that as a product. I'm not specifically familiar with what is the distinction between, you know, pipe on pipe and friction reducers. I know you guys provide both. Um, so if you can kind of lighten us uh, into this, this aspect. Well, so friction reducers actually decrease the friction of the fluid as they go through the pumps. So their main function is to try to keep those pump pressures constant or as low as possible okay. while keeping those pump rates high. So uh, you want you want to keep that, that pressure at surface as low as possible. Okay. So mostly and with, for surface benefit then in operational. Right, because and, you're you're pumping such high rates coming of of those fluids coming through. It helps those fluids as they go through, as the name implies, it reduces that friction. So you can get more pressure. And we we'll talk about the two different functions or the, the two different methods that people use here in a minute as well. But okay. so for like with the friction reducer, we do testing at our Houston lab. What do it's called flow loop testing. And so it's important to pick the right FR that's compatible with the fluid, because if you don't, that's going to, it's going to result in reduced performance and which is going to, you know, increase your, <laughs> your volume and hence your cost, which operators aren't going to be happy about, or you might be pump, pumping a bleacher by side and, that's not the most compatible with that FR. So we do testing with that, with the, uh, with what, whatever water system you're running to, to figure out the best system for that. But at, so at drill cam, we have liquid FR and the dry, uh, dry add FR, which is where we kind of stand apart from our competitors. Liquid FR itself is typically only 30 to 40% active. So the rest of that liquid is the carrying mechanism. So that's gonna tend to be more expensive just because you're having to use more volume because it's only 30 to 40% active. However, it is the most common. You'll see again, most guys will be running this liquid FR. Here at Drill Cam, we have a product called Rionic. It's about 60% active. And so that acts as an FR and viscosity builder. But also we have the dry FR. And so that's, 100% active powder it comes in sacks rather than totes, which is what the liquid FR comes in. And the dry end FR is compatible in a wide range of fluids. And so when we do our testing, we'll, uh, we will run it with liquid and then we'll run it with dry FR. But if you do run the dry FR, you have to have a special setup on your actual mixing plants that you're using because you don't want it to get wet and you know, it's just, it's really going to deteriorate it rather than it being in those plastic totes and, for the, against the weather. But for a lot of the operators out here in South Texas and doing a lot of work in the DJ and the powder, if they've traditionally ran that liquid FR, but we show them the cost effectiveness of running this dry FR because you're using less. So they'll, they might say, well, I've always ran liquid FR, so I'm comfortable with, and we'll say, hey, we can do whatever you want. But we can also, as we drill out some of these plugs, We'll drill them out with the liquid FR like you are asking, but then we can also drill out a plug or two with our dry FR so you can see that it works and that it performs uh, just as well, if not better than that liquid FR, but it's going to lower your cost. 
Is that just because it's more condensed and you don't have the added um, carrier fluid? Yeah, I would compare it to drinking a Coke to get your sugar intake rather than just drinking sugar. You know, there's actual, uh, there, there's more. You sound like a wild uh, man. <laughs> just drink yeah, straight sugar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, drink Mountain Dew all the time out here. Right. But yeah, so so with that dry FR, it's it's the actual active ingredient that's in the liquid FR. But so that's what you're popping. So on our mixing plants that we have out here, you just kind of trickle into a system. You can you can set a, a certain amount, whatever rate that is that you're looking for, for for that dry FR, and it'll just it'll go into the system again, get mixed up with the active water, and and then pump it down hole. So there is actual. Are actually some situations where the liquid FR does work better, though, correct? I would well, assume. Yeah, so again, it really just depends on if you're looking at price points. So mm -hmm. like the company I mentioned earlier that's, that's drilling out, uh, you know, they're producing 30 barrels a day, so they might have a lateral that's, say, a mile long or something or half a mile long. So they might run just that liquid FR because their lateral is so short and they're not gonna be using as many fluids. Whereas as you approach two miles, two and a half miles, you know, mile and a half, that's really where the dry FR is gonna save you money. Okay. And then in terms of running the dry, did you say that um, you, you, don't, you don't need a, a mixing plant if you're running a liquid or you need a mixing plant either way? On site. Yeah, yeah. You need a mixing plant either way. It just okay. depends. So on, there's no additional what, equipment cost then. Right. Exactly. So our, for example, our mixing plants can run both. So if that operator did want to run that liquid and then and then try dry a farm, our units can do both. But most there are some some companies, some drilling companies out there that offer that. But I'd say the vast majority, and you'll see them if you drive by location you'll see the, the small units out there. And so it's just basically two tanks and then they'll have two or three totes on top of that. Just very basic equipment out there. Whereas our mixing plants that I'll go to here in a second to run that dry at a farm or enclosed. So if you're in say the powder or somewhere in November and you're, you're drilling out, it's going to be pretty dang cold or in January uh, in North Dakota or even out in West Texas right now. So they're heated and insulated, but that's where it's protecting that dry FR. So it, it won't activate it or it won't be deteriorated until we blend it. Okay. I mean, even maybe even from a health perspective, even to some extent that it's not blowing all around location. I mean, that's one of the big issues with some of the, the frac sand kind of delivery methods <laughs> have been kind of historically. So that's a good point. Yep. And then with the, the pipe on pipe, so the drilling guys will know it as a lube, but our product here at Drill Cam is called Coil Lube XR for extended reach. So that's a lubricant that is designed to reduce the friction between uh, the coil or stick pipe and the actual casing itself. So POP pipe on pipe, you have that steel casing or a uh, yeah, still casing rubbing against that the actual pipe itself or the cool tubing. So with our lube, you'll puff it down hole in sweeps and it'll it'll coat whatever method you're using. And so it'll get in between the casing and the actual coil itself. And then it'll it'll just slide on top of it. And because since it has that affinity for metallic surfaces, it'll it'll adhere, adhere to it. And then as you get further out. Uh, you'll continue to pump that. And some some companies will pump five or 10 gallon slugs, which are just very concentrated sweeps to increase ROP. So if you notice your ROP might be decreasing or you start to stall out, or if you look up and you say, well, it's not as spinning as fast as, a, as it was, then you'll pump a, a five or 10 gallon slug, whatever it calls for. Okay, and rate and of then, penetration for anybody who didn't know. Yeah, exactly. And so uh, the rate of penetration depends on the, the type of frac plugs, the, the bit you're using, and then as well as how much friction you're running into downhole. But we have operators 
that'll even run our cold loop XR if they're not running our mixing plants, just because a lot of the, the pipe on pipes are very commoditized. It's like production chemicals. Uh, so they're not highly specialized, but like our cold lube XR, we'll have operators sometimes that'll say, hey, we, we want your lube out, even though we're going to use a, a different mixing plant company. Okay. And okay. that's effective at, at, at very low concentration. So okay. like when, when we do testing in our lab, it reduces the coefficient of friction by 85% at like a, a quarter gallon per 10. So. Oh, wow. Okay. And maybe a silly question here, but <laughs> if you're coating, you know, the inside of, you know, the casing and the outside of the, the drill pipe or whatever you're using, have you seen an effect where whenever you pump that down, like you coat the top of that plug and you have a hard time getting into it? You know what I mean? <laughs> well, so it depends on how how far these plugs are spaced out because okay. <laughs> sometimes you're, you're you're talking say two three hundred feet or something. So, and with these sweeps being so small, it's not like on the drilling side where you're pumping twenty barrels sweep, twenty barrel sweeps. Here on the on the drill side, you're pumping much smaller volumes because everything is so much smaller. So mm-hmm. you're not gonna you're not gonna flood that system and and. Uh, basically spin on top of the plug, which is what I, I think it, that you're going right. for. So by the time you, you get down there, um, you, you know, drill out that plug and then pump another sweep. So it'll decrease that friction right there between the casing and the actual pipe. Okay. So and then the pipe on pipe, just to kind of recap, so that's just coating. It doesn't do much to the viscosity of the fluid, right? To change that or change the fluid system like the FRs would, it just coats kind of the, the, the pipe. Uh, within the well yeah so as it exits the bit it's just going to come out and, and kind of slick things up okay to use uh <laughs> but with an actual friction reducer itself that their main job is to not tear up the pumps so they can get as much pressure going through as they can whereas that the pipe on pipe is used further down hole is the pipe on pipe lubricants are they used primarily in in horizontal wells or are these in verticals as well yeah but so usually in horizontal wells you'll start pumping that that pipe on pipe as you get to the hill of the well and so once you start going horizontally that's when uh, your cold tubing is is going to sit or really rub against the bottom of that well bore or your stick pipe or, or whatever so most operators are going to run it once they get closer to or once they get around the hill through through the toe of the well okay and for a complete for a drill out that's gonna be most the most of your time then because you're not drilling out anything really usually much if any during through the the vertical section right unless there's like an isolation plug or something right and it it, sometimes it takes a minute four minutes five (laughs) minutes whatever to actually build a plug out itself Mm -hmm. And really, once you mill that out, you're, you're going to go on to the next plug. So again, that could be 200 feet away. So it, most, I would say most of the time, it doesn't really take long at all to, to drill these plugs out in the horizontals. Okay. Yeah, and another chemical um, you had mentioned that you wanted to review too is kind of the, the diverter side, right? You're kind of like the, the drill out equivalent of LCM, you know, on the drilling side. So. I know previously we talked about, you know, if you're getting a bunch of production, you know, pump and kill fluid, all this kind of stuff. Um, so what are the scenarios and and what has happened when diverter would be used and its functionality? functionality? So using a diverter or in some cases, uh, an operator might use nitrogen to, to uh, heal loss circulation, but so that's when you would use the actual diverter. And at drill cam, our diverter, is called PerfGuard and it's it's acid soluble. So, uh, especially a lot in these older fields that are really depleted, or they're going in and refracking them, or they're going in and uh, working over that well, or or whatever. That's when it becomes very important to maintain returns during that drill out process because if you don't, one that those particles could go into the formation, or or really they could it's they could pack off on the side and you get stuck so if you're wanting to pressure up but when you do all that pressure goes into the, into the formation because it is so depleted then that's where it becomes important to have this diverter so you might pump a five or ten barrel sweep 
after every plug drilled out or after every other plug. And so that'll go into, uh, into that formation and seal it off temporarily. It's not going to alter your production at all. But that way, as you continue to drill out, you can get these plugs out of the well without losing those tools or, or pipe down holes. Okay, got you. And then a lot of times on the on the cool side, you'll see nitrogen out there. The problem with that is it's more expensive. You got to have those uh, big units out there. And with the diverter, uh, we, we actually have a very small. We, we call it little red. We have a little red <laughs> out here in the South Texas. We'll send it out. But so, uh, workover company might have might be doing something to their well. So we'll send this little bitty trailer out, but it'll handle uh, that perf guard. So you can mix up these sweeps and then it'll, it'll connect to their system and pump it down a hole. And to pump the LCM, is that through the mixing plants too? Um, or how do you get that down hole? Yeah. Well, that's where the, the little red, you know, oh, the little red. Right? Okay. Yeah. That's said. where, our, <laughs> that's where our expression comes into play. And so it'll have a, a small tank on it and you can mix up a, a small pill and then, uh, it'll go with that water as you pump that sweep through. Okay. Do you ever have, uh, do you ever have many customers come into you guys to even utilize diverter you know, during a frack job or something like that? Um, have you, have you seen that, like, add that application within completions itself to, or refracts like intentional. So it's not so much like remediation, like, Oh, we've got some, you know, the zone's taken drinking the well a little bit. Uh, we're not really getting returns instead of like remediation. Do you actually see it? And the completions like design. Yeah, um, I mean, we've so with that perf guard, I mean, we've ran it. If, if guys are drilling these plugs out, and for whatever reason, that formation once it was fracked, and you know, once the actual perfs are in there, it, it might have touched another zone or something that um, kind of as the fingers go out that they don't want to touch, and then that channel goes somewhere else, and then next thing you know. You're losing all returns so we'll do that as well and it'll actually get into that formation and uh help you pressure up so gotcha yes there's, there's definitely uh, i've heard diverters you know a couple different times and seen some even at uh, trade shows and whatnot and there's all kinds of what different sizes and uh different ways you can order it and do they actually um dissolve um when they're in formation for a while or like, you know, your your um, perf guards that you guys pump. Yeah, yeah, it's it, we've never had any one plane of of complaint of production issues, and a lot of our customers are repeat customers. So okay. obviously, it's hard to get the production data from them. But uh, <laughs> I figured if we would have plugged off one of these some of these perfs and really altered production, then we would never be called back again. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> And again, it's acid soluble too. So if that is a concern of yours, you can pump acid down hole on it. It'll completely dissolve. Okay. Gotcha. Do you know of any other, so any, any other chemicals that um, are used commonly um, that we haven't covered yet or, or more specialized or anything else that you have uh, along these lines of, of chemicals used in drill out? So some of the common chemicals that you'll have, you'll have your corrosion inhibitors, which is to protect the, uh, not only the cool tubing from, from having that pitting, but also the casing. So you'll be pumping corrosion inhibitors, H2S scavengers. You might have some H2S waiting on you when, as you start to drill these these plugs out. And then you have biocide or bleach. It depends which way you go. Some guys will do a biocide treatment. So X amount per, uh, per treatment and then send that down hole. And that biocide is what will keep away the, the bugs and everything. But another important chemical is our stabilizers. So you'll hear of clay stabilizers. And those prevent the formation from getting hydrated from that water. And mm. so if it did get hydrated, it could swell. And once that formation swells, obviously you want as much production coming out as you can. So if you think where that perf is, it could swell and then you're not getting as much mm -hmm. oil or gas out of that perf as possible. So it's a cheap insurance that many operators will run. Yeah. And then you're also, another very important part is running a gel or polymer. So their job is to thicken the fluid and build that viscosity. So you can carry the fluids down hole and then carry the debris out of the hole. 
Mm-hmm. So that's one of the of the another commonly ran chemical. But so there's two different methods, and so one requires that gel, and that's more of the conventional route, which many operators will, will still run. And so you're pumping one of those vis sweeps after every plug that's drilled out to clean the hole. So you can imagine it's a viscous fluid that's coming out and then as it exits, it's gonna collect that debris down the hole and then bring it back to surface so you can get it out of the well bore. And it's generally easier, it doesn't require as much data. The other method is called Reynolds. So if you hear of someone using the Reynolds method, they're cleaning the hole with rate and viscosity. And so if you, if you can stay in Reynolds, which there's a certain window that you have to be in, it can be less expensive because you're pumping less chemicals. Whereas on the conventional side, you're using a lot more of that gel to get the debris out of the hole. But with Reynolds, again, you're, you're altering those, those rates to create that turbulent flow, which is going to help get that debris out of the hole. So it's constantly uh, the fluids down there are are churning up the track plugs and residual sand or whatever to come out of the hole. Okay. So on the uh, quick question on the clay stabilizer. Um, so you mentioned, you know, the reason you pump it basically to prevent, you know, the formation from swelling, right. When the water hits it, um, that you're drilling out with or whatever. So how do you get it down there before the water hits it then? You know what I mean? Like to get it in place, I'm guessing before you, start drilling out or pumping all the water like how do you get that in place then well so you can blend it with the actual active water itself and so um it'll basically chemically or be tied chemically to that so as it goes down that water won't be able to hydrate and rather than just pumping that, that straight fresh water so you'll have that clay stabilizer mixed in and so just a high level overview to basically kind of cancel it out Mm-hmm. okay gotcha so it's not something you have to have always in place right from the first moment but you can pump uh kind of continuously so it just further keeps protecting it proactively right okay gotcha and you said the conventional and reynolds right those are the two the two names correct yep okay. so whenever i'm making a sales call that's one of the most important things is asking asking the engineer are you going to be running reynolds or are you going to be uh, running conventional Okay, gotcha. Because that, that really de- dictates which way we're going to go, which chemicals are going to be used, which mix and plants will have out their price point, uh, that whole thing. Okay. Now, what kind of specific difference does it make with, with all that? I'm just kind of to sum it up. Well, so with the Reynolds, you have to have data capabilities. So you have to have some of these higher tech units out there. Okay. And that's to help monitor the actual, the rates and everything. Whereas conventional, all right, yeah, we drilled a plug out, you know, it's in the suite. Reynolds, you have, Reynolds is is just more maintaining. So sometimes it it can be more work, but however, it saves more money, but you do have to stay within a certain window. And so that's why our fluid technicians are always looking at the viscosity readings and pressures and flow and growth from the pumps and everything. Okay, gotcha. I definitely appreciate all this context you're throwing into all this and I hadn't really heard anybody go into depth really on the conventional versus Reynolds. Jacob, is this making sense to you as someone who's a little bit newer to the drill outside? I am pretty new, but yes, that is making a lot of sense to me. Um, I guess one question just to kind of clarify a little bit. So for Reynolds, basically, it, uh, I guess in comparison to the conventional, it require it does require the real-time data, correct? Correct. Okay. Yep. So that back you know, that data is you know, numero uno, very important to have, and uh, and not only have, make sure you guys are monitoring. So that's where having experienced technicians comes in, in handy because if some of these jobs you might pull up to and guys are kicked back in a chair, but you really want somebody to monitor that. So you can definitely stay within that window, and because if you fall out of Reynolds, then that's when you could back off or you know uh, not get as much debris out of the hole. Okay. Yeah, I was going to ask what happens when that when you get out of the window. But so when that does happen, then what's the remediation of that? Do you pump like the some of these chemicals that we talked about to kind of or like the gel to kind of sweep it up in a sense? Or I assume you have to add in another additive basically to fix what problem you caused. Yeah. So for instance, you might have to increase your FR usage. 
your friction reduction usage to uh, for those pressures and, and the so you can increase the rates to get back into into Reynolds. Okay. So that's typically what you'll see. Gotcha. And then so with the units themselves, uh, the actual mixing plants, some units, as I mentioned, can run Reynolds. Some are are just they you can pump gel sweeps and everything, but they'll most of them all have an active tank and then a sweep tank. Your active tank is the water that's constantly being blended. And so what we do uh, at drill cam on the mixing plant side is we pull water from the frag tanks and then we have filter pods that it goes through. And those filter pods, even though you have your, your flow bag guys that are catching those uh, frag plugs, it'll go from there into the frag tanks. There's usually several. And as the water goes through, the sand will fall out. And then once it comes around, hypothetically, it should be clean. But we run uh, those dual filter pods to get any other sand that might be coming through. It's because we want to have the cleanest fluid possible. So, <clears throat> but that's an active tank. That's where the water coming from the frag tanks, that's where it's being circulated. That's where you're mixing things up. That's where, uh, and then with the actual, the sweep tank itself, sometimes you might not need it every, all the time, but if you need to um, mix a sweep of pipe on pipe up or, or something like that, that's where it comes into handy. And we have mixing plants across the spectrum. So if you talk to an uh, operator or service company, they might just want something extremely cheap out there because their guys have been doing it for 40 years. So they know how to get by with the cheapest cost possible. So we have some units out here for that, especially in those or depleted fields where they're going through. And then we also have our elite unit and it's, that's a fully automated control unit that has the data capture. That's what we're running um, that dry FR with and it's all touch screen. So whereas on the conventional mixing plants, you have one of our food techs out there that has to manually open and close these valves whenever you're gonna send a sweep down hole. With the elite units on the touch screen, you can type in every uh, you know, a 10 barrel sweep, every plug drilled out or whatever. So you can actually track the chemical injection and usage rate with these, with these elite units, with these smart screens. So you can go in there, it'll show you the graph and everything, the valves, which valves are open, which ones are closed, the pressures, which again is very important for Reynolds. And that data also allows us to see the trends. So if the pump rates are going up, well, why is that? Well, you might need more FR, something else might be going on. Uh, uh, bleach or biocide might be inhibiting the FR performance. So mm. with that, since it is automated, we have a, uh, it's a smaller active system because you're constantly pulling water. And so it's a 30 barrel active versus a 25 barrel sweep tank. Any other questions or anything you have on your end, Jacob? Uh, we're going to, have to start wrapping up the episode for for time, but uh, yeah, a lot of good thoughts uh, here. Cool. I got one last question. So you're talking about if you were to if you're running Reynolds and you have to fall out of that window, you said that then you kind of have to like figure out how to get things back within that window. So if you're using the Elite where it's all automated, um, is it often that it falls out of that window? And if so, does it course correct on its own, or how does that work? Well, so we still have our fluid tech there, so he's talking to the company man or the superintendent, whoever's on location. So they'll have a, a pre-job meeting, and so they'll go over safety issues, and then, okay, here's how I want this well drilled out. So he'll give mm -hmm. our fluid tech out there after, say, for pipe on pipe, after every plug drill, starting with plug number 47 or 35, I want you to, to pump a, a timber barrel sweep. So you can actually program that in to those automated units where it'll, it'll stay w within that. And so, uh, but he's there to help with, if anything goes wrong, he's, he's constantly looking at that data and feeding that info back to the company man. And, and they're talking. Gotcha. And then one, one more thing is afterwards we have a post job recap. And so we'll send out, uh, summary of, of what the costs, you know, all the chemical usage, and then we'll actually have graphs with like the pump pressure, the pump rates, uh, the plug number versus time. So you can you can see afterwards exactly how that job performed 
from beginning to finish. Awesome. Well, sounds good. I appreciate all the, the context that you've added here with uh, into this conversation. Look forward to diving a little bit deeper even into these topics and the upcoming webinars. But thanks again so much for for being on. I really appreciate it. And um, you're welcome back anytime. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again for having me on, Derek and Jacob. And I'm trying to set up a uh, field day at our Brian College Station Yard. And I'm out here in Midland, so at our Midland yeah. Yard, just just so you can see, if you're not familiar with that dry floor, if you just want to see our elite units or if you haven't seen them before because you've been in office for a while. So I'm working <laughs> on setting that up sometime in, in August. So once I do get that set up and in the books, it'll actually be a, a real lunch to learn. We'll have lunch for you there. And so you can see how our units are ran and everything. Talk to our techs with any questions. But once I get that figured out, I'll definitely let you all know and, and we can shoot that out. Absolutely. Sound good. And I can drop uh, your contact info in the show notes also for anybody to reach out with any questions or anything further to you. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for, for being on it. Jacob, thanks for co-hosting. Glad to have you on, on board also asking these questions. Well, thanks so much. So much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. Well, thanks everyone. And thanks, thanks everyone for listening. Be sure to drop us a review in uh, on your, your favorite podcasting app, whatever you're listening to us on, be sure to drop the share review that helps others to find us uh, and also helps our show uh, go further. So thanks again for listening, everybody. Stay healthy and safe, and we'll catch you in the next episode.